Hi, this is Dr. Kessler. Uh, this is uh, PUAD 630 Analytical Methods. This is our third lecture. Topic is decision making under conditions of uncertainty, and we're going to be covering the first half of chapter six uh, in a very few number of slides. Major points uh, we need to uh, appreciate when we dive into this section of the class uh, that we're really trying to understand uh, how to use analytical methods to support decision makers. How do, how do we understand decisions? What are the key elements of decisions that need to be analyzed? Uh, we're going to understand uh, this concept of expected monetary value, which is a way of helping us uh, figure out if we have multiple alternatives, which decision might be the optimal decision. Uh, we're going to uh, look at how to develop a decision tree, and we're going to look briefly at sensitivity analysis. After I get done with the PowerPoint slides tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to bring up the template uh, for project number, uh, assignment number three, and I'm going to cover one of the three tasks uh, for that assignment. Uh, I'm going to try to show you very briefly how to develop a decision tree using Palisades Precision Tree software. So complex decisions, uh, recognize that, you know, if it's a simple decision like, uh, you know, should I uh, order new pencils uh, or not? Uh, we don't need a complex decision model, right? We're out of pencils, we order them, right? But sometimes we get to a point where decisions are, are more complex and you'll see examples of that in the readings. You'll see examples when you have to work assignment number three. Um, and so we recognize that with complex decisions, uh, we usually are faced with uh, uh, multiple alternatives, multiple things to decide upon. Uh, we're faced with uh, uh, a, a variation in terms of the success or the outcomes, how much we get, how much benefit we get from each of the three decisions. And we probably are faced with uh, having different probabilities that each of the decisions occur. And so you'll sort of see that in one of your assignment three tasks, uh, you're going to be asked to uh, analyze uh, the decision as to whether uh, the uh, emergency management folks should evacuate or not evacuate uh, or partially evacuate in the face of a coming hurricane. Okay, so we'll have three decisions, right? Don't evacuate, uh, recommend evacuation, and uh, demand or order evacuation. And so we'll uh, look at those things and we'll put some costs because there are certainly are costs associated with performing an evacuation. There's uh, personnel costs and there's uh, uh, communication costs and there's lots of costs associated with it. And then we have probabilities that the hurricane may or may not hit. It may be a direct hit, it may miss us completely, or it may sort of partially hit us, right? Sort of a partial glance. And so we have to sort of take those factors together, the three decisions to evacuate or not, the uh, outcomes, the cost of each decision, how much will, will we spend if we don't evacuate, how much will we spend if we partially or recommend evacuation, and how much will it cost us to fully evacuate the place, and what are the probabilities that the hurricane's going to hit. And so, you know, if we have those variables, we have all the elements of a complex decision and being able to use the tools that we learned this, uh, in this section of the course. Uh, whether that's uh, expected monetary value, which I mentioned briefly, or using a, uh, a pretty cool little decision tree. So we'll sort of talk about that. Uh, by using the formal framework for analyzing decision problems that involve uncertainty, we can really reduce the complexity of the decision because we sort of structure it. Uh, we can use uh, a quantitative approach, you know, not a hard or heavy math, but we can use a quantitative approach to help select the optimal alternative and we can also engage in what-if analysis. Well, you know, what if the, uh, the probabilities change of this hurricane? You know, what if uh, the likelihood that it's going to strike goes up or goes down? What happens to my initial decision? Um, and uh, there's some examples here on the slide, like uh, contractor decisions regarding whether the bid low or bid high to win a contract, uh, introducing a new service without uh, knowing the potential client reactions to it, deciding whether to invest in new technologies. There's lots of Lots of opportunities for us to uh, structure complex decisions. Uh, decision analysis elements, uh, I really already mentioned them. Uh, the, uh, although decision making under uncertainty occurs in a wide variety of contexts, 
all decisions that are complex decisions have the common elements. Uh, there's a set of decisions. Should I evacuate? Should I recommend it? Or should I force it? Or should I not evacuate? Uh, there's a set of possible outcomes. Uh, you know, it's going to cost this much in terms of money and in terms of potential lives lost for each of those different decisions. And then there's probabilities that uh, that the hurricane might strike and therefore that these different decisions might be the right decisions or the wrong decisions. So uh, recognize that you know we have all these key elements um, uh, and if we do we can sort of apply decision-making methods uh, in, in that context. And so once we have these key elements we have the decisions, the possible uh, expected outcome values and the probabilities we can use techniques that we learned in this class. Uh, the first technique is discussed early in chapter six. It's called expected monetary value. Now, it's not a hard, it's not a hard concept. Uh, and so please spend time in the early parts of chapter six. Uh, and what you'll see with this particular technique is uh, that uh, we can take any decision where we know the different decision options, we know the outcomes and we know the weights, and we can build a model called an EMV model. And that EMV model will tell us the optimal decision. And so in this case, and again, I know it's hard to, to see. Uh, perhaps I can zoom in just a little bit. Oops, wrong direction. Zoom in just a little bit. Make a slight adjustment to the camera. And you can see that table a little better. Um, at the top of the table, you can't see the bottom very well. But at the top of the table, uh, what we have are the decisions, D1, D2, and D3. Now listed across the top of the table uh, are the outcomes, outcome 1, outcome 2, and outcome 3. And then sitting in the middle of those cells is the values. If we make decision 1 and outcome 1 occurs, uh, the value 10 is included. And in the case that's discussed in your textbook where this was taken from, for decision 1, uh, there's no risk. 10 is going to occur no matter whether uh, outcome 1 occurs or outcome 2 or outcome 3 occurs. And so if you look on the far right hand side, you can see the EMV, the average of those uh, values, uh, given that there's 100% probability, is going to be 10. So uh, that's the expected monetary value. Uh, for decision 2, uh, we get a little variation. Uh, if uh, outcome 1 occurs, uh, we get negative uh, 20, sorry, negative 10. If outcome 2 occurs, we get 20, and outcome 3 occurs, we get 30. And so, uh, and if you look down at the bottom, make sure you can see the bottom here. Sorry, this camera is not, not cooperating with me. There. And if you look at the bottom now, you can see that for D2, and I'll, I'll point to it on, on the screen, and you can see D2 here, we have probabilities that associate with D2. And so the likelihood that the negative 10 out, outcome 1 will occur is 30%. The likelihood that outcome 2, 20, will occur is 50%. And the likelihood that outcome 3, 30, will occur is 20%. And so what, <clears throat> excuse me, what we need to do in order to get this value, this EMV over here, is use our old friend from assignments uh, 1, part 1, and 1, part 2, uh, sum product. You can see the sum product calculation here. We need to use uh, that sum product calculation and uh, and we and we use it just the way it's shown to you example to be able to calculate this. And what it does is it multiplies 0.3 times negative 10, 0.5 times 20, and 0.2 times 30, and then it sums or averages them and gives you 13 as your EMV. And the same thing happens with de with decision three. Uh, we've got our value different values for the different outcomes. We've got our probabilities, which are different than D2's probabilities. Again, we use a sum product here, and it gives us a calculation of 15. So what it sort of suggests to us is the optimal decision in this case is D3 or 15, which is the highest of the three values. And so uh, that's your challenge in your uh, part one of assignment number three, is to use um, the EMV uh, model that you're seeing here in order to be able to um, in order to be able to figure out an optimal decision just using EMV. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our uh, 
Let me just get this all the way out here. Sorry, sorry. But it's hard for me sometimes to, to, to get it exactly right. But anyway, that's the uh, discussion of expected monetary value. Now, uh, the expected monetary value, you'll find, I think you'll find it's fairly easy, as long as you remember how to use this sum product function that you learned back in the early weeks. Uh, uh, we're going to do decision trees as well this semester. And so we're going to actually build what you just saw prior to this, which is called a payoff table. And, uh, and uh, in prior semesters, I've made the students for the second half of assignment three actually build the payoff table themselves. But this semester, I've taken a whole new approach. This is the new and improved Dr. Kessler uh, that caused so many students grief that I've actually am going to give you the payoff table for part two of your assignment. But what I am going to ask you to do is to use Palisades decision tree to produce a decision tree um, for the payoff table in part two of the assignment. So I just want to go over very briefly uh, some details about decision trees and then actually uh, we'll bring up a spreadsheet and I will create certain parts of the decision tree and let you see how, how it needs to be done. Okay, so let me uh, just make sure, let me get my camera set just right there. Let me get it a little more inbound there. A little larger here. Okay. So. It's drifting back up just a tiny bit. Okay, so I'm going to leave it as is here. Okay, so let's talk about decisions, decision trees. Making difficult decisions in the face of uncertainty is really, you know, as this thing says, some of the hardest decision-making problems we know. And we sort of talked about it so far. Uh, decision trees allow us to uh, structure our decisions, our payoff tables visually, so we can actually see the little mapping with little, uh, with little branches and spokes. And, and be able to sort of look and, and understand visually uh, the decision path. Um, and so it, it also enables us to calculate an expected value, an EVM, just like we did in the prior problem, but the decision tree tools will calculate the values for you. And it, it lets us select the path that has the highest expected value. Uh, recognize that a decision tree is a flow diagram. It shows the logical structure of a problem. It, uh, there, there are four pieces uh, to a decision tree, and I'll, I'll go over these in a second. Uh, one is uh, the starting point, which is a square box, right? That's your decision. And so you have to make a decision and you have multiple alternatives. Uh, the chance nodes uh, are the um, intervening decision pathways, right? So if we uh, have six possible alternatives uh, after our square box, we're going to see six of these uh, chance nodes or circles. Uh, if we have three decisions, uh, after a square box, we're going to see three circles. Uh, and then for each of the uh, circles, each of the pathways we're going to follow, as I mentioned to you earlier, we need to know the, 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 out, the, the dollar value or the value uh, if we follow the particular pathway. And we need to know the probability of, of achieving that dollar value uh, along the pathway. So we still need to know uh, the decisions that need to be made. We need to know the outcomes that could occur and we need to know the probabilities for each of those outcomes. So, um, so recognize that, you know, and, and this is really taken from your text, and your text is a very good description of, of how to do um, decision trees and how to use Palisades uh, as your tool. Okay, and so the best way will be to identify the decisions and chance events that need to be included uh, and to uh, hold, out, hold off for a second on probabilities and payoffs, but you will need that information. Uh, and so this is visually what it looks like. If you take a look at uh, uh, the uh, screen here, you can see that uh, I have my starting point, my decision, uh, and in the textbook they talk about olive branch, uh, uh, trying to decide uh, whether uh, uh, she should sell her script to television or to the movies. And that's an example that's used in your book to, to get you moving along on an easier example of decision tree. And so this is your starting point. It's the first thing you introduce is this little box, right? And so uh, you fill in whatever you want over here to represent the big decision. Uh, in the case of part two of your second, your third assignment, assignment number three, part two, it's going to be uh, deciding how to invest your money in stocks and bonds and safe stocks, risky stocks. And so this would be called investment decision. And I'll show you that in a second. Now, in the case of Olive Branch and your tax, she has the two basic pathways. She can either sell to TV and if she sells to television, she's going to get a flat amount and there's a, uh, you know, it's a fixed amount and, and there's uh, certainty and assurance with it. But she also has an alternative to sell to the movies 
and she sells to the movie, she can make uh, a lesser amount, a uh, pretty medium amount, or a very large amount. So now you get, uh, you know, hmm, which pathway should I occur? Am I willing to take a risk? And if you sell to the movies and you have a small box office, you're going to get a certain return for that decision. If you sell to and you have a medium box office, you're going to get uh, a return. And then finally, the large box office off offers the highest possible return. And all that detail is given to you in your example in chapter six. So recognize the decision tree. Start with the decision node, square box, right? See, it says decision node here. Uh, your alternatives are, are incorporated next. And your alternatives are characterized as branches. These lines coming out are called branches. And so uh, when you first set up this decision box here, uh, you create two branches. You fill in the description of the two branches and you're on your way. Uh, and the two branches in this case will be sell to TV or sell to the movies. My cat's outside the door. He wants to come in, but I'm not letting him in. Uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, this is the completed model or, or more detail on the model. <clears throat> After we uh, recognize there's no more decision to be made if we sell to the TV, we just take the money. But once we sell to the movies, we've got these three options. Uh, we uh, insert the uh, chance node or the circle, and then we fill in, we let, this, we let the software know that there's three possible pathways, large box office, medium box office, small box office, and then at the end of this, you can see, well, after, after we go down this way, the large, if it's large box office, that's the end of the decision process. So if we sell to the movies, there are three possible outcomes, depending on how well the movie sells. And then three outcomes are represented by a circle or, or a chance note. Okay, now we fill in the values. Uh, remember uh, on a couple slides ago, it said, first figure out what your decision and your, uh, and your pathways are, and then figure out what your actual quantitative values are. So, and we were given this in the text. We were told if we sell the TV, we get $900,000. So that's been filled in using the techniques that I'll show. Uh, and so we know that, that if I go this path, it's a $900,000 return on investment. Uh, now we have uh, different returns on investment given to us in the problem in the book. Uh, if we have a small box office, we're only gonna get 200,000 instead of 900,000. 30% probability of a small box office. If we sell, get a medium box office, which there's a 60% probability of, uh, we'll get a million dollars, which is more than 900,000. And if we have a huge box office, and, and there's 10% probability of that, we'll get $3 million. So, you know, there's a 10% probability here that I could get 3 million instead of 900,000. So what do you do? Do you take the 900 grand and run, or do you, you know, roll the dice and hope for the big box office and you have confidence in your product and you get to a point where you can, can make 3 million instead of 900. I'd take that any day, uh, 3 million over 900. Right, and so we add these probabilities and these payoffs. I'll show you how to do that. Um, and then the uh, decision tree uh, then calculates for us, and it's not shown here, but it calculates the actual uh, results and tells you what the best, best pathway is. And so um, if we go back to the technique we talked about earlier, the EVM technique, uh, we uh, could use our um, tools and our uh, sum product, as we talked about before. And what we would learn by calculating the different, uh, multiplying the probability times the value is that the, uh, the expected value of selling to the movies is 960,000. The guaranteed value of selling to TV was 900. And therefore the decision probably is best uh, to sell to the movies uh, because you got the better expected value. Uh, but there is risk and there's risk that you could get uh, a lot less. Um, okay, and just recognize, as I mentioned, that once you uh, finish putting in all the values in the decision tree, it comes back and says uh, 960,000 you get by using the sell to movies versus the 900,000. So it gives you this true and this false. And so the true path is it's telling you that's the way you should go for the $960 estimated value. So precision tree is a very useful tool. It actually punches in the, uh, the expected, the EMV. Uh, values for you. Now, just like we did in cost-benefit analysis in assignment two, uh, we really have to do sensitivity analysis uh, on our decision because, you know, we have to make sure, well, what if we're off? What if we're off in terms of how much we'll get for selling the script to the movies? What if we're off in terms of probabilities? And so we have to sort of like play with those. We have to go back and maybe save our original model and then copy it over and then start changing things in the model. And that enables us to do uh, 
uh, to, to do sensitivity analysis. And there's tools inside of Palisades to do sensitivity analysis as well. But what we want to do when we are working with decision trees is we want to go and modify some of the input variables. And then as we modify the input variables, see if the decision changes. How far can you change the, uh, the values, the numbers, the expected outcomes before the decision switches back? Or how far can you change the uh, probability ratio across the three options before the decision shifts back to sell it to TV? And that's what sensitivity analysis is all about. So what we're talking about a little bit tonight is uh, how to understand decisions, um, basic decision analysis elements. That would be your decisions, your outcomes, and your probabilities. Um, a, uh, how to calculate expected monetary value by taking and weighing the uh, decision times the outcome times the probability and averaging across all the possible outcomes and you get your, your expected monetary value. We talked a little bit about sensitivity analysis and we talked about developing the decision tree. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift out of the slides and I'm going to bring up the template you're going to get uh, on Sakai for uh, assignment number three. So let me switch out of here. I'm going to bring up the, the template. Uh, it's going to go like this. Uh, you're going to have it downloaded onto your computer if you're using non-Macintosh. Uh, you're going to click on the template and open it as this is doing. You're going to be, you're going to go to part number two, the decision tree, and you're going to see a bunch of data that you're being given by Dr. Kessler. Recognize last semester and all prior semesters, and I've taught this for many years, uh, had to make this table up themselves. So consider yourselves uh, um, in a good position here. Uh, I increased the taskings in another part of this assignment. But for this part, you, you should be uh, grateful that you don't have to create this. Now, what we have is a decision to invest uh, $10,000 at a 3% risk-free rate of return. And uh, what you can see is uh, we have six different decisions. So we put all the funds in a risk-free account. So we put half in a risk-free account and half in safe stocks. So we put all funds in safe stocks. So we put half in a risk-free account and half in risky stocks. So we put all funds in risky stocks. So we put half in safe stock and half in a risky stock. And so those are all completely different options and alternatives. And so um, you were given some, um, some um, values uh, by, that were calculated by me. This is called a payoff table. And so uh, based on uh, some of the information given in the problem assignment, uh, we learned that uh, if we put everything in a risk-free account, no matter what the uh, uh, no matter what the probabilities are, we're going to get three hundred dollars, regardless of the of the probabilities. And so that equates on the example we just saw to the uh, selling the uh, script to TV. It, you know, we know what we're going to get, and it's going to be three hundred dollars, and that's your expected monetary value. But we now need to calculate with ten thousand dollars to invest at three percent. Uh, what uh, the expected rates might be from these other combinations of investments. And you're going to have to develop the decision tree for this. So uh, you can see that if we, um, in, we put half of our stock in a risk-free account, um, which means it's a safe stock return, and half in a safe stock return, we're going to see probabilities here that are uh, 6%, 8%, and 10%, and a very low risk. Okay, so... Um, you can see the values have been calculated for you at, at um, if uh, the outcome um, is 6%, if the return is 6%, we get $450. If the, uh, if the return is 8%, we get $550. And if the return is 10%, we get $650. And we can see that same thing repeat itself all the way across the table. When it's 6, it's $450. When it's 8, it's $550. And when it's 10, it's $650. And those numbers are again de developed based on the fact that we're using safe stock return percentages here. Uh, if we put all of our funds in a safe stock account, uh, we can see that we have uh, some risk as well. Again, we have the safe stock returns. So again, we're looking at 600 for 6% 6 return. We're looking at 800 if we get an 8% return. And we're looking at 1,000 if we get a 10% return. And those numbers repeat themselves across the table. Okay, so you can see this. You can see what it looks like. Um, now, um, in order to, and it goes down and on, so you don't really have to worry so much about how they were calculated, 
But what you do need to do is to be able to figure out how to build a decision tree uh, for this uh, particular uh, decision table. And it's no easy task, I can tell you. And so uh, what we need to know first is how many decisions do we have? And if you look at this, you can see that there's six decisions, right? And so we know that uh, when we come into building our decision tree, uh, we're going to have to, at that first square, have six branches, six, um, six of those uh, pathways coming out of our first box. So I'm going to go down here and begin to, um, and as I tell you in the instructions to the uh, assignment, you should print that table you just saw, and I have mine printed. You can sort of see, in order for me to work with this, I'll hold this up to the camera. I printed it out, right? I went to my, my computer and I printed out exactly what you see here on the screen so that I could actually be able to figure out when I start to, to use decision tree um, palisades uh, what I need to do for each of these six pathways, right? So I come to this point. Now I haven't started palisades yet. And so once you open up Excel, you have to uh, go to your software after Excel is open and click on palisades precision tree. Now I have my icon. I don't know if you can see that. My, yeah, my icon is located right at the, down on my taskbar. So I'm going to click on Palisades. It's going to take a second up here and it's going to uh, produce the add-ins tab up here and it's going to in a second give me a toolbar for precision tree. So you can see it gave me the precision tree logo. I click on OK and now I have my precision tree uh, toolbar up here. And this is described very well in your text too. So be sure to uh, keep that text handy when you're doing this. So I want to start a decision tree. So I go to decision tree here and I click on decision tree and it wants to know where I want it to be located. And I'm going to locate it there. So that's where I have my cursor. So now it wants to have a name for the decision tree. And so you can type in your name. So I might type in investment decision or whatever, whatever you like, type in whatever name you like. Okay, so now the investment decision and the first uh, end node is located here, um, but that's not what I want. I don't want that end node to be there, so I want need to change that node. So I come back and I just click on that triangle. You see the little hand, and I click on the triangle, and what I really want is a square box, because I learned in my book and my other example that a square box is the starting point. It's the decision that needs to be made, right? And so uh, I click on the decision and it wants to know sort of a name. I just leave it as decision, but also it wants to know up here branches. You see it? There's another tab at the top that says branches and it says two. Now it's the default of Palisades to give you two decisions, but you know, in this uh, case, we talked earlier about how many decisions we have to make in this problem and we need six. So uh, there's a button over here that enables us to add more decisions. And so I've added the decisions. The next thing I need to do is I need to change the names because I don't like branch one, right? So the first case I will call this all funds risk free, all funds in a risk free account. Now I've got this thing printed out. So when I paused there for a second, you didn't hear me talking. It's because I was looking at my printout to see what the first name should be for that very first decision. Then I come to my second decision and I, again, using the chart that's up here on the side here, I type in half risk free slash half safe stock. Right? I can abbreviate if I want and so on. Now I'm not going to do all these, but you sort of get the idea. Now recognize that uh, the all funds risk free, we talked about that in the table and we noted that the value of that was going to be 300 if, if we go that route. Because, but the rest of these we can't make decisions about because the values change depending on the risk. So uh, we're going to have to break the subsequent decisions down into more parts. So I'm going to leave that like that and leave the rest of these at zero and I'm going to click OK. I really should fix branch three through six like you will when you do this, but I'm not going to do that right now. And when I do that, I get uh, a series of, uh, of uh, branches and the series of branches now are six in number and the first two have the names I typed in and the other four don't. OK, 
Okay, notice also that uh, all funds risk-free gives me a 300% a, a return. Uh, it's 100% probability because I left it with an end node and I typed in 300, so I know that 300, I'm going to get $300 if I go that path. Now right now, since I haven't typed anything in these other pathways, they're all zero, and therefore um, Palisade has told me that this is the way to go because I'm going to get $300 instead of $0. But that might change. It might change when I start to enter the other, the other values. So again, uh, I, I'll just hold up a piece of note paper that I did before I just go into this presentation. And I hope you can see it. It's just a, a piece of paper. But if you can see here, I took D2, decision 2, and I noted that it was a 6%, an 8%, and a 10% um, difference in that decision, and that if it's 6%, I get 450. And I remember I got that from the table. If it's 8%, I got it 550. And if it's 10%, I get $650. And also in that table were the probabilities. You see these probabilities here? So I pulled the probabilities off of 25, 50, 25, which were in that table. And this is the second decision, half risk-free and half safe. So if I come over and I click on this triangle here, I can continue along the way. I can create a, a chance node. This is where I create my chances. Now notice that it says branches up here are two. I need three because I said to you earlier, uh, there's a 6%, an 8%, and a 10% uh, um, outcome. And so I need to add a branch here. And so I, add, I go and I add the branch. I will rename the first branch uh, 6%. <laughs> I'll rename the second branch 8%. And I'll rename the third branch 10%. Got that from the chart, right? Uh, the probabilities over here say 50-50. Well, that's not right. If you look up on that chart, I can't show it to you now because it's scrolled up. Um, but I wrote down the probabilities and I noted that the probability of 6% was 25%. The probability of 8% was 50%. And the probability of 10% return was 25%. And I noted that if, it, if, if for decision two, that uh, if it's 6%, I'm going to get $450. If it's 8%, I'm going to get $550. And if it's 10%, I'm going to get $650. And that's all I need. I click on this and I've got the second branch of this done. Um, and so you can sort of see that now this guy is worth 550 bucks to me. Once it did the, remember the sum product that we did earlier in the example, uh, this, so this pathway is worth $550, which is better than the 300. So now notice that this one is true and this one is now switched from true to false. And that's what Palisades does for you. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let you finish this out. I basically completed two of the branches for you. Now note that when you stare at the payoff table that's sitting above in this spreadsheet, you're going to notice that there's three, uh, diff, uh, three, um, pathways here, I forget what they're called, uh, th three branches here. You're going to note that there's three branches for the fourth option. There's three branches for the fifth option. And I'm giving you a very important piece of information. If you listen to this lecture, this is worth a, probably a difference between an A and not an A. There are nine branches on the last decision. The last decision is half of the funds in safe and half in risky. And so there's nine different decisions. So again, spend a lot of time looking at the uh, payoff table that I've given you and making sure that you understand when there, when there are three decisions, what are, the, what are the payoffs and what are the probabilities? And recognize that for the very last row uh, that there's a different payoff and a different probability for all nine of the combinations across that payoff table. It's very important. So if you have three more, three... Um, branches here, three branches here, three branches here, and nine branches here, you're going to have a very nice decision tree. So it's all I wanted to share with you. I wanted to give you a brief overview. Never done this before and students have been jumping out uh, uh, windows and tall buildings and uh, screaming on the way down. I don't want you to do that. So I hope this is helpful to you. Uh, it's the end of lecture number three. I'll see you again in the next lecture.